Pooja from Filecoin. Um, and today Juan and I are going to be presenting on some really interesting opportunities for Filecoin integrations for pinning services and other Web3 infrastructure providers. Um, so earlier today, we talked a little bit about some of, of about the mission of Filecoin and some of the core problems that Filecoin aims to solve. And this is all in service of our goal to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanities information, as we discussed earlier. In this talk, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into some of the technical details of Filecoin, and, um, and we're going to focus on a few key Filecoin integration opportunities. Um, so I'd like to start by setting the stage a little to just explain how Filecoin works and some of the resultant properties of the system um, to motivate why these integration opportunities are interesting um, for pinning services and other businesses that are looking to integrate Filecoin. So starting with a little bit of the, um, how the Filecoin protocol works, Filecoin is a market that matches clients who want storage services with miners who provide storage services. The network manages the interactions between the two sides of the market. So first clients can decide which storage miners they want to make deals with, choosing across dimensions such as storage price, available storage capacity, and location. And once the storage deal is made, clients will transfer their data to the miners. Clients will also set up, uh, lock up Filecoin tokens in payment channels that they set up to pay the miners for um, successful storage over, of their files over time. The Filecoin protocol repeatedly asks miners to generate proofs, which we call proofs of space time, to verify that the miners are continuing to store the data correctly over time. And then after miners um, submit these proofs and they're verified to be correct, the network contracts will pay the miners the correct amount of Filecoin tokens. And this is a repeated process throughout the lifetime of a storage contract that exists on the Filecoin network. In order for the system to work, clients need to be able to trust that the storage proofs work as intended and that the network protocols themselves um, incentivize honest behavior on behalf of all of the participants in the system, including clients and miners. In Filecoin, the way we enable this is by using our secure cryptographic proofs, which are um, the proofs of replication and proofs of space time, and also crypto economic mechanisms. Um, these systems work together to ensure that all participants in the network are behaving honestly and ultimately that when a client sends real money to pay for storage on a decentralized storage network, they can be guaranteed that their data is being stored correctly. <clears throat> so there are certain mechanisms in the Filecoin protocol that result in really interesting and important features, um, network properties, and then ultimately participant behaviors. So I wanted to dive into these because I think it um, provides an important foundation as we talk about some pinning service business opportunities. Um, first, Filecoin rewards storage miners with block rewards. And especially early on, we've seen these effects play out over and over again in a number of other crypto networks. Um, especially early on, these block rewards are expected to be extremely profitable for storage miners. And we, we therefore expect that they're going to be powerful incentives to onboard massive amounts of storage capacity. Our expectations are that um, around the time of mainnet launch, we should see uh, at least one exabyte of storage that will join the network around mainnet launch to like one year after mainnet launch, and then many exabytes of storage capacity to follow. And the vast amounts of storage capacity, just like in any sort of two-sided marketplace, um, this is the supply side of the marketplace, just having lots of storage capacity is going to drive down the price of storage on the network, um, resulting in ultimately relatively cheap storage. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's kind of unique about Filecoin is that in contrast to other protocols um, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, which require miners to generate proofs of work, um, which are not necessarily tied to the underlying asset of the, of the system, Filecoin crypt cryptographic proofs are what we call useful proofs of work. Um, this means that miners are generating proofs over storage space, which is the same underlying asset that they're also selling on the network. The hardware that miners use to provide the useful service of storage capacity and storage services on the network is also the same hardware that is necessary in order to generate the proofs that are used to earn block rewards and ultimately secure the network. Um, so this all feeds back into a miner's economic system, making it relatively cheaper to generate proofs on Filecoin than on other crypto networks, um, and ultimately resulting in cheaper storage prices overall. Um, so the next one is, you know, because we want Filecoin to be a decentralized protocol that has these really um, you know, really clear data storage and availability guarantees. This is the reason why we've used cryptographic proofs like proofs of replication and space time. 
Um, but it's just you know a property of these cryptographic proofs that while they allow participants in the system to store network really cheaply, retrieval on the network is comparably slow. So um, you know we have a process in our proofs called that's called unsealing. So when you first commit storage to the network, you seal the data. Um, in order to retrieve the data, you need to unseal it. And around the time of mainnet, we're going to have unsealing take on the order of tens of seconds. And so it's a lot slower than what um, pinning services and IPFS users might be used to. Um, this is one of the properties that comes out of the cryptographic proofs of the system. Um, but this is also, you know, I think it creates a, a tremendous opportunity for pinning services to provide a lot of value in the early Filecoin network as well. And we'll dive into that a little bit more later on. Um, the Filecoin token is the medium of exchange in the Filecoin storage network. And so this means that the token's underlying value is also fundamentally tied to the asset that it is used to pay for. Um, you can use Ethereum to pay for Filecoin storage one day, but or you know, even in the short term, um, but you can also use Filecoin to pay for Filecoin storage. And this has a lot of interesting properties as well. And then lastly, um, the Filecoin protocol has implicit incentives for geographic distribution of network nodes. So the reason for this is, you know, many clients, storage clients, are much more likely to hire storage miners that are geographically closer to them in order to be able to transfer data back and forth between clients and miners more quickly. And in many cases, as a result, for miners, it would be more profitable to start up new operations in regions that are unsaturated, that don't have as many other competing storage mining nodes. Um, rather than competing for a set of clients in a saturated Filecoin market. And so what this ends up looking like across the entire system is that um, there are just implicit, implicit incentives to populate new regions and new markets, which ultimately leads to the Filecoin network having very powerful CDN-like capabilities. So I know this is kind of a lot to take in if you're sort of new to Filecoin, but I think these features are useful to keep in mind as they help explain why some of the Filecoin integrations that we're about to discuss are actually really compelling business opportunities. Um, so we'll talk about a number of these opportunities today. I'm going to cover uh, two of these, and then Juan is going to dive into the rest. Um, so the first Filecoin integration we're going to discuss is pinning to and from the Filecoin storage network. So this is kind of a very generalized, simplified view of an IPFS pinning service today. Um, but, you know, as we all know, IPFS pinning services provide this really important service for applications in the ecosystem that want to use a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer content address storage network, network, but who also want data persistence. Um, and so this, this view of, you know, a generalized pinning service looks like an IPFS pinning API, maybe similar to the one that Juan uh, discussed earlier, that developers can call into from their platforms and from their applications. Um, and the pinning service itself holds all of the business logic that's necessary to manage user accounts and user pin sets, as well as managing the underlying IPFS nodes. So the first integration opportunity that um, is pretty straightforward is, um, is just taking all of the data that is currently um, stored on IPFS nodes and backing it up to the Filecoin network. The second option is uh, which you know deserves a little bit more explanation, and we think of these as truly Filecoin-backed IPFS pinning services. In this model, you can think of IPFS kind of as the hot storage layer or caching layer, and the Filecoin network as the colder storage layer. Um, the way that we envision some a service like this working uh, with using Filecoin storage is that when an application makes a storage request to an IPFS pinning service the service automatically will store data on both the IPFS hot storage layer and the Filecoin colder storage layer. And the data may remain on the IPFS side, on the IPFS storage layer for some time um, until it's cleared out by some sort of intelligent garbage collection strategies. And then after that point, that particular CID would only be stored on the Filecoin network. Then when the data needs to be received, uh, sorry, retrieved, Pinning services can pull the data from the hottest layer that has the storage. It could still be in the IPFS cached layer, um, in which case the pinning service would pull the data from IPFS directly. Um, and in some cases, it may not be on IPFS and, and it would then have to be retrieved from the Filecoin network. Um, so pinning services would need to make use of you know, intelligent caching strategies to determine when does it make sense to pull data back from Filecoin into this hot storage layer and so on. And um, these caching layers are also an interesting point of differentiation for pinning services that might choose to adopt this kind of architecture. Um, but there, there, there's an also relevant to note that 
both IPFS and Filecoin transfer IPLD, IPLD data objects back and forth with each other, and they also both speak lib-P2P protocols. So um, this sort of manipulation of data and networking between IPFS and Filecoin networks um, should be pretty straightforward in, in, uh, in, uh, depending on whatever architecture you decide to use. So let's talk about why this is compelling. Um, <clears throat> first, Filecoin backed pinning services will still offer sub-second retrieval to existing pinning services service users that depend on this sort of fast sub-second retrieval speed. Um, but the other benefit is that these sorts of pinning services will allow greater alignment with your Web3 application users. Um, all of the underlying data, ultimately, if we go back to the architecture, would be stored on a decentralized storage network, which is Filecoin, as opposed to a, you know, a centralized Web2 service provider like Amazon Web Services. And so this offers directionally better product market fit with early pinning service adopters. It's a compelling business opportunity, too, in a number of ways. Um, you know, first is just, as, as we mentioned, Filecoin storage is expected to be pretty cheap. And especially for um, data that's stored infrequently, we anticipate that the cost will be quite low and uh, these sorts of cost savings will both make the operations costs of running a pinning service a lot cheaper. And also um, these cost savings can be passed on to pinning service users. And that's, that will also create this interesting flywheel. You know, if you're able to pass on cost savings to users, you might be able to grow the market for uh, pinning service users as well and allowing you to then have additional you know, bulk storage at cheaper cost and so on. Um, and so we think that that's like a really compelling opportunity if you're able to use Filecoin as um, the underlying storage layer. The other reason is that pinning IPFS data on a decentralized network will, like Filecoin, will strengthen the pinning service value prop within the growing Web3 market of applications. Um, we expect this to exist organically, kind of just because of this greater product market fit and user alignment that we discussed earlier. Um, but it's also because, you know, the Filecoin project is starting to engage in business development efforts to exp expand the Filecoin user base. And um, in fact, this is already happening. We plan to direct application developers to pinning services that are backing up or storing their data on Filecoin. Um, so this would be, you know, just like just collectively growing all of these ecosystems um, with effort from number, uh, a number of groups, including the Filecoin project. And then another benefit is that a lot of the tooling that's needed in, or, in order to enable these Filecoin backed pinning services is also needed to enable other business opportunities. Um, these are some that Juan will talk about later, but in particular, it includes, um, you know, if you, if you are able to batch data that needs to be stored in the Filecoin network, um, this can actually be a useful service that you could expose to users as well. So we think of that as charging for data aggregation services. Um, we know that most pinning services today don't actually charge for retrieval, but Filecoin has payment for retrieval sort of baked in, and uh, a Filecoin integration could al allow for charging for retrieval um, pretty naturally for pinning services. And the third is, you know, if you're able to develop intelligent caching strategies, um, caching as a service or like charging users for caching uh, services as well could be another opportunity to explore. Um, we believe that Filecoin backpinning services are going to be a really important entry point for Web3 web application developers who want to interact with Filecoin storage. And so we're planning on offering Filecoin dev grants to support teams that choose to integrate Filecoin storage into their pinning solutions um, by around the time of mainnet launch for Filecoin, which will be July, uh, July or August of this year. Um, you can reach out to me directly, Pooja, uh, in order to get more information on what these grants look like, or you can also email devgrants at filecoin.org. Um, one easy way to get started with building this type of Filecoin back to pinning service is to use Textiles PowerGate, which Andrew is, uh, and Aaron are gonna talk a lot more about in the next presentation. Um, but the high level is that Power, PowerGate embeds an IPFS node and a Filecoin node, and it exposes this, exposes this really intuitive API to interact with both. PowerGate is really valuable because um, it abstracts away a lot of the complexity of storing data on the Filecoin network, such as how do you select miners? Um, how do you maintain storage deals over time? And once the storage contract has expired, how do you renew that storage contract? There's a lot of complexity in kind of doing all of this deal management on Filecoin that PowerGate um, provides a really seamless, like really intuitive interface for. I won't go too much into the details here since Andrew and Aaron are going to give a whole talk on it next, uh, but PowerGate is going to be a really powerful tool for pinning service providers. The next opportunity I'd like to talk about is storage mining. 
So we believe that there is a massive opportunity for Filecoin storage mining. Um, some estimates expect that by 2025, we're going to be generating something like have generated 175 zettabytes of data in the world, while we'll only have around four and a half zettabytes of data storage supply. Um, that's, I think, the diff between those two. It's, it's around 40x more data that we are expected to generate than we will have space for. And so clearly there's a huge opportunity, even if you assume the appropriate haircuts and maybe we're not actually going to generate 175 zettabytes of data, but it's like half or a quarter of that. Um, and even if a lot of that data is discarded, there will clearly still in the future be large demand for storage services. And this is not in the far future, but over the next few years. Filecoin as a market enables a host of services to put storage up on the network. Um, you know, this is, this could be the top three cloud storage providers, but it also pr pr uh, creates an opportunity for a host of other groups, you know, other cloud storage providers that maybe aren't, you know, the large, the largest um, players in the ecosystem, but also service, uh, you know, businesses that do storage backups, telcos and ISPs, data warehouses, storage hardware manufacturers, consumers who may have their own storage setups at home, crypto miners, and also we believe pinning services. So Filecoin's aim is to provide a marketplace where players in any of these verticals can provide their storage capacity for rent on a marketplace and um, abstracts it, you know, it straps away all of the marketing um, needing to maintain nodes in different regions and so on and provides a really uh, seamless user experience for storage providers that want to sell storage to users who need it. Um, touched on this a little bit earlier, but the network compensates storage miners in a number of ways. And um, just to touch on a few of these, you know, the probably at least early on, um, we anticipate a large, a large part of the rewards or the compensation for storage miners will come through block rewards. And these are earned proportional to the amount of data that you as a miner would be providing to the network. Um, so block rewards we anticipate are going to be extremely profitable early on. And so uh, that's like just, but that's just one portion of the Filecoin storage miner business opportunity. Um, the other is transaction fees for processing messages. So as a storage miner, you um, still do the work of creating blocks just as, you, uh, as, as miners do on other crypto networks. Um, when clients decide to uh, pay storage miners or include data on the Filecoin network or just users sending transactions back and forth, of, uh, to each other, all of these messages need to be processed into Filecoin blocks and storage miners or any miners on the network that um, produce blocks can earn transaction fees for doing this work of block production. And then the third is, um, is probably the most important, like definitely in the long term, um, but Filecoin storage miners also get paid, of course, you know, for the service of storing and retrieving data on the network. And so the payments that come over time from the network contracts, um, as miners submit their proofs of space time, they get paid in Filecoin tokens as well. Those deal pay payments are a recurring source of revenue for storage miners that provide um, storage services on the network as well. So, you know, there's a lot more we could say on the Filecoin storage mining side. It's not directly a tie-in to pinning services and what pinning services do today, but I think there's a really compelling opportunity here. And especially if um, your, your service or you run a service that has you know, storage capacity that you maintain or some of it is idle, Filecoin storage mining could be a great opportunity for you as well. I'm going to talk about the, how to take payments, how to operate a storage real market operator and, and how to consider potentially selling other kinds of services. Um, so for the Falcon payments part, um, uh, if you're familiar with a, with a lot of crypto payments, then this is going to be very similar to to everything else you're used to. Um, we followed all all the normal standards around um, around uh, signing and so on. We've got integrations with a bunch of um, of different kinds of uh, uh, hardware wallets and so on um, to make all all of that all the tooling kind of work as usual. Um, and we're working on on payment processors so that parties can can deal with payments and and process all their payments. Um, uh, uh, as well, and like that's that's an easy thing. Uh, that's if you're familiar with how all that stuff works. Uh, if you're not familiar, um, I'll I'll send out some links that kind of explain how the whole process flows. But I'll I'll give a, a kind of a brief description uh, description now. Uh, so basically, you what you can do with with Falcon Falcon supports two kinds of um, payments at the moment. One is just a direct payment transaction that goes into the chain, and so that's a kind of a slower payment. Um, and the second is a payment channel. 
um, that is optimized to work alongside retrieval. So the idea is that um, uh, data is flowing one way and payments are flowing the other way. And payments are and data are kind of moved around incrementally. So you can think of um, moving chunks of, of a file or, or um, maybe one file out of many um, and then receive a partial payment and, and so on and keep going. Um, and so that way, if, if a party stops paying or, or um, uh, there's kind of like a, like a, um, a trust failure, meaning a party paid but never got the, the file, then the kind of transaction can be aborted uh, quickly without kind of losing a lot of, a, a lot of money or, or a lot of the data. Um, and so the, the payment channel flow is, is uh, um, uh, implemented in the chain as well, and, and you end up with, with Falcon tokens. Um, the, once you have these tokens, they're kind of these units of account on, on the blockchain. Um, they end up in, in kind of spread out in, 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 in potentially a number of accounts if people are having many different machines running this and, and so on. And, uh, and so there are these kind of tools called payment processors that then like kind of gather that uh, together and then kind of do accounting for figuring out what, um, what deals actually happen and, and, and whatnot. Um, and then you can clear the, uh, and then you can effectively trade the, trade the file coin for, um, uh, you, you, at that point people have a choice of whether or not to, um, uh, th those miners hang on to that file coin and then use it in the network um, uh, or something, or or then to kind of sell it to to clients and users that that want to use it for uh, for storage, right? So this is a um, the medium of exchange can be um, uh, can be sold through through a, uh, will will be um, uh, kind of sellable through through whatever um, systems kind of support that. Um, I imagine that uh, it, it's likely that in in Ethereum there will be kind of some like wrapped wrap file coin kind of thing. Um, and so people will be able to use Uniswap and all that kind of stuff to, uh, to move, to move the tokens around. Um, and so this, this means that it, it, uh, it, it ends up fairly easy for parties to accept file coin payments with use of payment processor to figure out what, what happened and then, uh, move to whatever medium of, uh, whatever store of value they prefer to, to keep, whether it's, um, keeping, keeping file coin or keeping some other cryptocurrency or moving to, um, a stable coin or moving to normal uh, fiat currency, um, either by going through a, a, a um, currency on, on like something like a USDT or, or something like that, or, or um, directly clearing uh, through, through some kind of fiat exchange or something like that. Uh, so those kinds of systems are, are um, uh, gonna be uh, kind of online at some point. Um, and and so it means that it's very fairly easy for a pinning service or or a uh, provider to accept platform payments without having to kind of bear um, a cryptocurrency market risk if you're not uh, if if you don't want to do that. Um, so you can clear it to whatever the currency of, of choice uh, is and and get the platform into the hands of of clients so that they can use it for for paying for for the storage. Um, and there's a number of like libraries and, and, and tools and so on that that will make all of this uh, all of this easy. Uh, so the next part, uh, so the, the retrieval market, we keep kind of talking about this. Um, uh, the way to think about it is that uh, if you have the ability to um, have a, a fully open market where any party that hears about a file being requested a lot can grab it and then serve it to users downstream, then you would get a sort of automatically scaling um, CDN that responds to to demand on the network, right? So imagine at the beginning, only a few parties have, uh, you know, some piece of data because they're, they're the parties that are storing it long term. Um, and then suddenly something becomes uh, viral and a number of people start requesting it. So the first few people that request it will go to those those um, storage providers first and, and retrieve the file. As kind of the popularity of the, of the um, item increases, uh, uh, the kind of ritual mi minor network takes notice and then, you know, parties can respond to that demand in their locality, meaning that if there's a hot um, area of, of parties requesting um, a file in a particular region of the world, then the ritual miners there are the ones who can um, decide to uh, replicate the file and then serve it locally. So think of it as making a more efficient distribution model um, by using Using markets and the ability to kind of observe the demand on the on the network. Um, so that's kind of like the the long term um, uh, goal for the retail market, where uh, it should be possible for for anybody with with a with a computer and some some spare hard drives 
to participate in and an internet connection, of course, uh, to participate in a retrieval market and be able to kind of offer up um, some amount of storage space to to cache really hot content that that wants to be viewed, um, you know, kind of close to them. And so this is where uh, geographical lo uh, location will matter a lot because it's it's not about kind of having a lot of storage. It's really about exactly where you are in the network and how quickly can you deliver something to to the parties requesting it. So it's kind of like the long term though. In order to get there, a whole network has to be built out of these retrieval parties who are spread out across the globe. So think of this as kind of day one of of um, of the retrieval network where the only you know kind of initial retrieval uh, parties are the same kind of storage uh, providers that are providing providing the files. Uh, and then kind of these layers of parties start emerging that are closer and closer to users. So imagine like the the first um, parties uh, appearing say in data centers spread out across a bunch of regions in, in the world. And then after that, kind of closer to the edges and kind of edge caches. And then after that, going all the way to kind of the buildings as, as we're showing here. Um, and so the film uh, market is, is the piece that, that'll work um, with this kind of uh, very low latency payment mechanism with the payment channel. Uh, and all of the payment channels in Falcon are, were built out for this use case because you, you cannot wait for for a payment to clear clear the chain, that's way too slow. You want to be able to do a payment um, uh, real time in, in one round trip. Uh, so you can think of like uh, you know a large gossip uh, network where where um, requests are being are, are being forwarded, and you know if if, uh, if somebody responds to the request and they don't pass it on to other to other parties, so you kind of see kind of like the hotspots of content um, uh, being addressed by by the content moving closer to those those areas. Um, and so. Uh, then th there's a whole set of other potential services um, that uh, that can be um, uh, kind of sold uh, through the network. And, and so that's um, a whole bunch of different kinds of um, developer processes, I, I like to call them, um, end up being necessary. So things like uh, aggregation, as Pooja mentioned. Uh, so the, the normal Filecoin storage, long-term storage um, uh, thing, uh, it takes a while to seal seal sectors and, and takes a while to kind of um, uh, store that sort of the account of this long term long term storage. Um, and so that means that it means that doing it in doing storage in bulk is a lot cheaper trans transaction wise. So that means that if parties want to store very little amounts of data, it's useful to first kind of put them all in like a long log and aggregate them along with other pieces of data and then batch all of that and put all of that together into a deal. And so we, we um, expect uh, there to be like a pretty significant opportunity early on for parties who are just kind of um, integrated with applications and, and providing the normal pinning service experience for for uh, for an application, who are then kind of combining all of these kind of aggregated logs um, and then batching writing out to to Falcon. Um, and so what you get is actually something very close to what happens in normal computers. So, so you can think of normal computers as like the CPU needing um, kind of like the really, really hot uh, memory and being able to kind of uh, pin in like the local cache and then going out to RAM if, if you need to when, when, when uh, you need kind of like a larger address space or going out to disk if, uh, and so on. And each of these steps is dramatically slower, but it gives you access to much more memory. So think of Filecoin the same way too, where there are different kinds of, of service providers at different tiers providing different parts of the equation. So there's like long-term really cheap storage that's potentially in some specific parts of the world, then there are much faster uh, caches that are closer to users um, that are responding to demand only. So if the things are not demand demanded or there isn't kind of a prior agreement to keep it hot, um, uh, things, things won't be there. Um, and then there's also kind of aggregation of, of, compo of data to, to make the writes into the, into the disk um, uh, be as efficient as possible. So, so normally the, the, all the normal intuitions you might have about how computer works and how CPU works and RAM and disk apply very closely to how Filecoin, the retrieval market, and, and uh, kind of hot storage close by um, works. So a bunch of the techniques have direct analogs. Um, uh, you can even think of like, so, so the term pinning in, in IPFS comes from the idea of pinning a memory page in the CPU and, and keeping it really hot. So the idea of a pinning service, keeping things really hot is like super apt. Uh, uh, so it's like a, exactly like a fits the, fits the bill. Um, there are also other kinds of things that, that parties can provide. And so this is, um, think of, think of there being 
you know, a class of services around uh, mining. So, for example, miners have to do this um, set of expensive computations uh, in in GPUs that um, in order to produce some of the proofs. Smaller miners are not going to want to buy a lot of GPUs to do these, these expensive computations. So they're, they're going to hire some other parties to to run these these uh, uh, these computations. So there are parties that are already offering um, kind of these GPU uh, uh, farms as a service uh, where you kind of submit the data that you need. They produce the the, the ZK snark and then they return it to you um, and then you you can submit it onto the chain. And so there's a number of kind of components of, of processing and and data processing. So, so both processing of, of proofs and so on, and also kind of like the, the data aggregation or data preparing, preparation and so on, um, that are all kind of smaller components where um, a bit of the right computation in a well-placed location in the world can, can you know, get a significant advantage. So think of this as, as just unbundling all of the systems that are in a, in a large scale, high performance production environment in say a normal storage cloud, like a centralized cloud provider, and think of all of the kind of different components that are involved in, in making systems like that work. And think of basically replicating those out in an open market where instead of it being a different process or a service in, a, in some, some large uh, company-wide VPN, it's a service on the public internet that, um, that different parties are running. Uh, whether, and, and instead of it being kind of um, only internally accounted or whatever, um, it, it's then just paid for by, by payment channels. Um, uh, and, and I imagine that there's a whole host of, um, of, of data prep techniques that, that will, be, will benefit certain kinds of, 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 um, of, of data flows um, where, where certain miners can, uh, where, where certain retail miners can, can participate in those kinds of operations as well. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's it actually. So maybe we can just take questions now if we have a few minutes for it. Do you see a JBOD next to a Cloudflare gateway in 200 plus regions around the world having an advantage of serving the data quickly? So yeah, totally. So, so that's exactly exactly what um, what an excellent retrieval miner would would do. Um, so, so really think of kind of how the current CDN CDN market works, um, and and just think of like mirroring that in 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 an open marketplace where where um, you don't have to write you know. You don't have to have a huge organization and write contracts. You can just take a take a machine, set it up, point it to the blockchain, run some code, and then it spits out cryptocurrency, and that's it. Like it, that, that's that's kind of like really the, the the whole thrust of Filecoin is to take what today is a a market that is um, mediated by large scale contracts through human organizations, and turn that into fully an open market where it's just programs running around. Um, and using uh, uh, cryptocurrency and um, and on-chain contracts to facilitate all the trades. Another question: uh, Do you see storage miner separation between the GPU, CPU, and the CPU storage only, and so on? Um, some amount. So uh, it is very likely that that large-scale miners are going to want to have their whole setups uh, in-house, and and the reason is that um, once you get to a certain scale. Um, you really need those operations to run very efficiently, and trusting another group to to do it um, might be might be potentially like um, like a party just missing delivering a CPSNR to you uh, might like cause you to lose a block, which then loses a block reward, which is adds up really quick. Um, so we expect that kind of large miners will will just kind of run the most of the operations in house. That said, medium and smaller miners are are unlikely to to have to produce that many CPSNRs, and so. They, it, they just need to produce them quickly enough at a given moment. And so this is exactly where, where a service could be, could be extremely useful, where we sort of expect to see these kind of like SaaS services, SNARKs as a service uh, things popping up uh, where, you know, you just submit, you know, it's kind of like an, an RPC, you submit like the, the data you need and a platform payment, um, and then you get back the, the, um, the SNARK computed. Uh, are the payment channels just small sequential payments, or do they have some form of state that's in Ethereum state channels? Um, today, it's mostly sequential payments. I believe they had a memo field. Uh, I'll go back and look. We debated that uh, a fair amount of time. It ended up, might have gotten removed. But um, for now, it's mostly just payments. Uh, we want to do state channels at some point, but um, we also need to, needed to keep the complexity of Falcon down. So that's one of the um, – the Falcon chain ends up being – way more complex than, than something like Ethereum because of the proofs and, and the consensus. And so um, that's why we kind of didn't have 
don't have a VM either because launching all of that, all of those layers all at once is uh, much riskier. So we want to kind of defer that out to, to later on. Uh, so a pinning service is like an advanced retrieval miner. Longer term, smaller retrieval miners could also become a lighter weight homegrown pinning service and CDN, EVC enough to solve post and earn. Yeah, that's right. So, so um, think of like pinning services fitting like the right spot to be serving, um, kind of like really serving kind of like the S3 use case now and maybe later the CloudFront use case. But then smaller, smaller retrieval miners might be even closer to end users, they're just going to have less of the market. Um, it's really, really useful to think of it as like a big grapevine, right? So the internet is shaped like a like a very, very large grapevine with many, many, many tiers. And so you can think of anywhere in the vertices. Um, in one direction, you have users downstream from you that are requesting data uh, or potentially uploading data. And in the other direction, you have um, you, you might have like the, most of the sources of the data are in that direction. And so as the first users start requesting things. Um, if they're going over this kind of public channel announcing what, they, what they're trying to get, um, then you can notice that. And if you know it trips on threshold, then then you pull the data yourself and now start serving it out to to others around you. Um, and so that that can happen kind of at every vertex in in that grapevine. So both at the very high levels where you would need very high performance machines and you're dealing with massive amounts of traffic because tons of people downstream from you, or or closer and closer to the user where suddenly latency is the advantage. Late, um, you're able to serve things extremely quickly to, to another party close to you, uh, but you have a much smaller slice of the market downstream from you. Um, and so that therefore, like you don't, you're, um, uh, it, it, yeah, you're, you're, it's probably like a limited, limited level of revenue. Now that um, what we would like to get is just an automatic scaling where content flows to the right vertices through the grapevine where it really should be to kind of optimize the whole distribution based on what, what is actually being requested real time. Uh, but, you know, getting there is going to require some, some amount of time of like really perfecting those, those kind of announcement channels and all that kind of stuff. At the very beginning, we sort of expect the retrieval uh, market um, to, to really be in kind of like the low, low hundreds maybe, or like even, even under a hundred at, at the very beginning of the network and then from there grow um, to, to thousands and tens of thousands. Um, Wondering how the geolocation is determined. Can I choose to store the data like in Australia? Because I know I'm going to access the, the data there in the future. Um, totally. So, so when you interact with a miner, so, so clients choose which miners to store through. And when they do that, they, they can see their IP address. Uh, and potentially, there might be profiles to them that are kind of generated on, on, on separate, separate services. Um, and so you can use, you, you can select miners based on a lot of features. So price is likely to be one of the main features by which people select miners, but there's a whole host of other reasons, like you might want it to be specifically in this particular region, or you, or uh, miners might offer other kinds of things like um, certain kinds of uh, security uh, thresholds. So some of the stuff that we've been thinking about is that a lot of data really requires certain degree of, of uh, confidentiality or or, um, or or regulatory levels of, of, uh, of security, so things like HIPAA compliance and whatnot. Uh, and we imagine that kind of stuff to be to be done eventually where certain miners can can um, you know promise to be HIPAA compliant and 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 um, go through the normal procedures that that parties go through in order to get those verifications and then be able to advertise that in the network. Just think of it as a as a full open market where where clients and miners can can make deals with each other if they if they um, desire it and you're not kind of rate limited by by human organizations gaining economies of scale. Quick question from Neo: What is the future of using mobile devices like smartphones for storage mining? Maybe subcontracts from repair miners. Um, it's likely that phones may be okay retrieval miners, and, and but like people's phones, if you keep them connected to a peer-to-peer -peer network, often they're going to lose drain battery and use a lot of data. So you, people probably won't do that. What I but there are a lot of phones, like many more phones than than there are people trying to use them. So and they usually have really good GPUs and really good good uh, good machinery. So I wouldn't be surprised if people set up like farms with phones eventually with to do different kinds of processing. Um, but I wouldn't expect it to be people's normal phones. I think what phones will be good for is moving around content in almost offline settings, where um, the fact that you're close to another person's phone means that you have access to the network, even if you're not close enough to an antenna yourself. So, so you can think of FireChat as a great example of this, of, of, con of content moving and routing through a mesh network. And so that, that's probably the, mo the most interesting use case for, for, uh, for the phone's case. Thank you very much. Uh,